Hello everyone, and welcome back to Chess Openings Explained. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and tonight I am going to be talking to you about a little bit of a more beginner-focused openings lecture. Uh, we're just coming off of, I think, a nine-part F3 NIMZO series, and when you spend nine lectures going uh, over you know, in-depth lines, in-depth variations, going very deep uh, into middle game plans as well, it can get a little bit you know, daunting. You start to lose sight of what actually is going on in the opening. And that's sort of wanna, what I want to talk about here tonight. Uh, the title of the lecture, I think, is something like Weak Squares and Bad Gambits. And that is what we're specifically going to be looking at. But in general, the main point I hope you get across, uh, I hope I get across tonight, is that chess starts sort of from the first move. And uh, by far, the most common mistake I see made by big beginners and sort of you know, amateur tournament level players alike is that they take these opening principles or they take their opening theory. And what they do is they use that instead of thinking. And it's really important to understand, and I think this is not communicated well to beginners enough, um, the opening principles are not your replacement for thinking. They are you know, a guide to help your thinking. Right? They're sort of a tool that leads you to think about which moves could be correct, not something you use to replace thinking. You don't just say, OK, I'm going to play by the opening principles, and I'll, you know, th things will be great. I don't have to think. Chess starts from the first move, and you have to be sort of on your toes thinking from that early, early stage. So to start with, I want to show you guys a game that I actually played against a friend of mine who we are going to call Tim. So I had the white pieces and Tim had the black pieces here. And Tim doesn't really play chess. He plays casually, he knows the rules, but he never really studied it at, at all seriously or anything. He just likes, you know, he, he plays chess like, like any of us would play another board game, right? You, maybe you know the rules, maybe you've played it a few times, but uh, it's not like you've done any study. So let's see how this game goes. I start with d4. And Tim responds in kind with d5. And so I play c4, the, the queen's gambit, of course. So I'm temporarily sacrificing my pawn on c4 in return for control of the center. So Tim decided he was actually going to take this and then declared victory because he was ahead up a pawn. This actually happened. Um, <laughs> of course, he was joking. But uh, for the moment, Tim is up a pawn. So before we move on any further, of course, this is not one of those bad gambits that uh, I'm talking about in the title. We'll get to that in a little bit here. Uh, so what does white get in exchange for this pawn? Well, for one, white gets control over the e4 and c4 squares. Now, how is this so? How does sacrificing a pawn on c4 actually give white control over these squares? Well, of course, with this pawn on d5, white does not have control over these squares. White can never really play the move e4 or else it'll be captured. And well, we saw what happened after I played c4. In this case, Tim decided he did want to take my pawn. But now that this pawn has captured on c4, it can no longer defend these squares. So at its core, you know, this may seem like really, really basic stuff, and it is, but white is weakening black's control of, yes, the center, which is probably how it's been phrased uh, before, if you've had this talk before. Uh, but also, these two squares specifically, and these are light squares. So if you play the queen's gambit accepted, uh, you know, even if you know the theory, it's important to understand that by taking this pawn on c4, you are inherently weakening your light squares. And so you should be cautious of weakening the light squares even further. And that's why after knight f3, my opponent's next move, while it may follow opening principles to some extent, is actually a, a pretty bad one. So black can do any number of things here. You can develop a piece with something like knight f6. You could even potentially develop this knight out to d7. Uh, you could play c5 to challenge this pawn. You could even play a6, threatening to, to keep your own pawn. These are all viable moves. But what Tim did here was actually uh, pretty bad. So Tim plays the move bishop g4. And you know, at first glance, uh, it may seem like a perfectly fine move, right? We're following all the opening principles. Right? All black has done is captured a free pawn on c4 and then developed a piece. So how can this be so bad? Well, if you use this sort of thinking where you just solely rely on the principles and you don't really you know, use, use your brain, you don't really think about it as a chess position from move one, 
then seemingly nothing is wrong with this. But you know, using this idea that I just talked about, where we understand that by capturing on c4, we have weakened light squares, we now understand that moving this bishop out further weakens light squares. Right now, we see that this pawn on b7 is going to be weak. And this bishop on c8 could have you know, been useful in defending perhaps a check from this diagonal, even defending along this diagonal. It, it may have potentially been useful, but now it's committed itself out to the g4 square. And worse than that, it gives white an avenue to actually start attacking these light squares. So chat, I want you guys to try and come up with uh, my next move in this game using this sort of principled thinking that we've been talking about. right? Black has weakened the light squares by capturing on c4 and further weakened some squares by moving this bishop out from its defensive spot on c8. So how can we start to take advantage of this, chat? What do you guys think? And yeah, the chat has a great idea already. And that move is knight e5. And that's what I played in the game. Uh, so this move in particular is one big reason why bishop g4 is not so good. But on top of that, even I want to say principally, but not by those simple opening principles of develop pieces, control the center, uh, castle the king, right? Black was sort of following those. But principally, by weakening light squares, black should no longer really be playing these types of moves that only serve to further weaken the light squares uh, in their camp. So with the white pieces, we should be looking to attack these squares. So knight e5 gains a tempo on the bishop and also starts to look at these light squares in the black camp. And you know, while so far principally black has actually made some pretty serious mistakes with this move, well actually just, ju just the one mistake with bishop g4, but it's enough to give white a pretty pleasant advantage just by ignoring this simple idea where black has weakened light squares so we should not weaken them further. And even worse, you've allowed this white knight to e5 where it can start to target some of those loose squares. Now that being said, of course, black isn't losing yet by any stretch. Uh, that is until Tim's next move, which was f5. So obviously this one is pretty bad. And this was a case, uh, I believe, of a little advice and a little misguided advice uh, is sometimes worse than no advice at all. Or having a little bit of knowledge on something is sometimes worse than having no knowledge at all. So the reason why Tim played f5, I, I talked to him about it after the game, and he said that he thinks you know, let's just say hypothetically, we continue somehow, that knights are really powerful when developed out behind a pawn. And this is true. This is really, this is super true. And that's why on the queen side, you'll often play c4 before playing knight c3. It's because the pawn and the knight control the same squares, and that's really powerful. It gives you really great, con really great control over those two squares. So this was the reasoning that, you know, Tim had uh, decided on for playing f5 followed by, by knight f6. And it's important to understand here that uh, while maybe to, to the chat room and to me f5 looks like a pretty horrible move, there is like logic behind it, right? The, you know, at its core, it doesn't sound like such a bad idea if you ignore the fact that all of the light squares are critically weak. And that, of course, is why f5 is a bad move because it shuts this bishop out from defending the light squares. It further weakens these light squares by moving this pawn forward. And now black is, is simply lost four moves into the game. Uh, but if you sort of turn your brain off and say, well, black followed the principles, right? Black captured a free pawn, developed a piece, and then defended the attacked piece. So why is black losing? Well, it's because black wasn't really engaging with the position uh, as a chess position. Black was more just so just sort of autopiloting, I think, up until f5. So much better would have been to save this bishop with something like bishop h5, or maybe even better is bringing it back to e6, sort of admitting, hey, my, my light squares are a little bit weak. Maybe I should try to defend them. But instead, f5, and now, of course, the winning move here is going to be to immediately uh, attack on these light squares, and I did so with queen a4 check, right? This bishop can no longer come back to defend, and black doesn't really have a comfortable way to uh, block on this diagonal. Uh, black should try knight d7, but this is not going to be enough for equality. It's not really going to be uh, anywhere, anywhere near equality. There are numerous ways to continue. Queen b5 is fine. Queen takes c4 is good for white. Kicking this bishop away uh, is also good for white, taking advantage 
of even more light squared weaknesses by attacking those squares with the pawns. But in the game, we never got, to, we never got that far because Tim played knight c6. And so once again, sort of the natural looking move, but of course here uh, it is simply just under defended on c6 and black went on to lose pretty quickly. Uh, I captured on c6, captures, captures, queen d7 would now lose the rook on a8. So king f7 was played. Uh, and then I play the move e4 with the idea being bishop takes c4 check is going to follow next. And unfortunately for Tim, he snagged this pawn on d4, threatening checkmate, but it was not good enough because bishop takes c4 comes with check and there's no good way to get out of this check for black. If you were to block with the pawn, then this is simply checkmate. So Tim sacrificed the queen and the game ended shortly thereafter with almost the same checkmate on e6. So it's easy uh, to see that Tim moves, Tim's moves in this game were, were not the greatest, particularly f5 I think is what a lot of people would latch onto. But I wanted to start with this basic example to sort of show you uh, what it looks like in, in the basic form. When you know the player with the black pieces maybe doesn't notice all the threats in the position and is sort of just flying blind, this is what it looks like. So once again, what we want to take from this game is this idea of understanding that you know, chess starts from the first move. And in this case, black has already made a really important decision by move two. And it's important to play sort of according to that decision. Understanding these squares that you've weakened, understanding that you need to be cautious of the light squares. And for that reason, you often see this bishop just sitting on c8 sort of for the, the entirety of the opening. Uh, until black is certain that they have regained uh, some control over those squares. So questions on, on this game before I move on to a little bit of a higher, higher level game. Why not queen d7 after knight takes c6? So queen d7 was, was better, but it, it is still losing. But yeah, queen d7 is a better try. Uh, as for what would happen, I think I can actually continue the tactics a little bit and play bishop g2 here. And then uh, th this is just, just quite bad for... Uh, quite bad for black. Sort of no matter what you do, I'm going to play knight c3 next, and then move my knight and win the game. But good question. The tactics were a bit more complex there. OK, let us continue on then. Uh, so next up, I want to sort of ratchet up the, the level a little bit. Uh, I want to take a look at two club level, tournament level players that uh, played a rapid game on chess.com just uh, a few days ago. So this is actually a game taken from the Corporate Chess League. If you missed our big finale to the Corporate Chess League, uh, it, it was a pretty fun one, pretty dramatic finish. If you guys are interested, we actually did stream it live. But I did want to highlight one game uh, that really does exemplify this idea uh, of the same light squares becoming weak in a d4, d5 opening. So let's, let's try and understand why here and what happens. So this is a game between DV Dutch, who I believe you know, may even be watching tonight. Maybe not. I haven't seen him in the past couple lectures, but he does watch the lectures often. And someone by the name of now this is just losing on chess.com. So let's take a look at how this game went. By the way, I should say uh, I just imported this game from chess.com. This is not uh, DV Dutch's actual level. I think he's around 1500 USCF, some, somewhere in that range. So 1000 is, is a bit underrated uh, just due to a lack of games on chess.com. But let's take a look. D4, D5, C4. In this case, we don't see black actually capturing on C4. Uh, we got the Slav with pawn to C6. DV Dutch then continued on with the exchange. We see knight C3, knight F6, bishop F4, and bishop f5. So once again, we see that uh, black is developing out this light squared bishop outside the pawn chain, as we have been told to do by principles. But uh, he's done so a little bit uh, sort of cavalierly, without caution. So white continues with e3. And you'll notice that, that white has done the same thing here. Black continues with e6. And then white plays the move queen to b3. And already, black, black is significantly worse. And I think that is probably a lot more surprising to some of you than in the previous example. Right? It's easy to see 
that, OK, bishop g4, knight e5, f5 in the first game. Of course, white is going to be better there. But here, in the exchange slav, on move 7, white is already sort of at, at, at least plus, plus 1. And the reason for that is black just has no good way to defend these light squares on the queen side. And this goes back to, to this thing that I said at the top of the hour. Chess really does start from the first move. And so just because you're in the opening, just because you are developing your pieces out naturally, doesn't mean you don't have to think about the game, or else you risk things like this, this happening to you, where suddenly out of nowhere, it's move seven, all you've done is develop pieces, and, and you are, are worse off. So how can you actually avoid it, right? Now, now we understand that this is a bad thing, but what should black have been thinking about here? So in the exchange Slav, what has happened? Well, white has captured on d5, removing this c pawn from play. So what happens when you remove this pawn from c6 uh, from play, when you trade it off for white c pawn? Well, number one, the queen has easy access to the queen side, as we saw in the game. And number two, of course, Number one, oh, well, sorry, number two, this pawn gets weakened on d5 because it no longer has this defender on c6. And you also lose a lot of control over this diagonal in particular because you can never have the option to play this pawn out to c6 or, or just have the pawn on c6 closing the diagonal. So once again, with this opening, white has successfully weakened the light squares in black's camp. So. Quite often, what you'll see done is players with black pieces develop the queen side a little bit, right, to compensate for this. They have light squared weaknesses on the queen side, so it's important to develop out the queen side pieces, like this knight, for example, helping to guard this diagonal, uh, and just guard squares on the queen side in general. And then after we continue, you'll quite often here even see players go as far as to play the move a6, just to simply control these light squares, prepare a move like b5, and compensate for the fact that this c pawn is gone and that white has easy inroads on this side of the board. Uh, as for learning to recognize these kinds of things in your games without sort of memorizing moves, well, that can be pretty tough. That's, that's why we always say, uh, we meaning you know, chess instructors, say the best way to learn is to analyze your losses and analyze all your games and look for spots where things started to go wrong. So, if you were playing this game with the black pieces, and it continued as follows here, white plays queen b3, you realize, hey, I don't really have a good way to defend this uh, b7 pawn. So you continue out with queen to d7, and then your opponent hits you with the winning tactic, which, uh, if you want to find it at home, go, go ahead and pause here, is, of course, to simply remove the last defender of the light squares on the queen side for black by removing this knight from b8, and then pinning the queen to the king with bishop b5. And of course now, white is simply uh, com completely winning. Uh, better for black would have been to play the move queen b6, sort of meeting white in kind. But white is going to have some edge here by doubling these queenside pawns. Now, there's a lot to say about this particular structure, but just trust me when I say that this is not a very good version, mainly because these pawns can't ever really even cross the, uh, the b5 square. White has good control over this square. There are some situations where if black is able to play something like b5 and b4, this can actually be perfectly fine. But in this case, really not a good structure for black, even though there is some compensation down the a file. So white's going to be better. Now, of course, this is much better, though, than queen d7 played in the game when dv dutch did correctly find this tactic and went on to win pretty easily uh, up, up the queen. So once again, higher level players this time, 1,500 online. It was a rapid game, but I suspect neither player would have spent much more time in the opening, even if it weren't a rapid game. Uh, just having played in tournaments at this level before, it doesn't really matter if the players are 100% familiar with the exact opening, with the exact opening line. They're going to move quickly, right? This is sort of just how it always happens at, uh, at the 1,500 level. You sort of want to get out of the opening so you can get to the game, so you can start thinking about the middle game, you know, play, play the real chess. But I'm here to tell you that the real chess, it, it's happening in this opening. It's happening right away. You have to be thinking about these chess concepts, not just about opening principles. So questions on this example before we, we move along. Uh, Ronum says, you're a chess newcomer. 
how, sorry, he says that he is a chess newcomer. How do you how do I analyze my games effectively? So that that's a good question. Uh, and I would say that if you're on your own and sort of trying to just learn chess the hard way, then the computer can be a really useful tool, but it shouldn't really be uh, th this massive crush, uh, crutch. So first, I would start with where you think things actually went wrong and think about, without the computer, how you could have done better. And then you can flip on the computer and sort of help it, ask for some help there, uh, where it can suggest some moves, and then hopefully lead you to some, some better understanding there. So for example, if you were to do this with black, if you try to analyze this game, you might easily write off queen d7 as the mistake, say that's why I lost the game, queen d7 was bad. But then when you realize that you already don't have a good answer to queen b3, that's when you have to start backing up and saying, well, hold on, well, like, how, how do I ever deal with my, my queen side light squares? And then hopefully you would arrive at the conclusion that you sort of need this bishop around to do it, or you need some more development here. And you can click around with an opening database on lead chess, for example, that, that, all, that all helps. But that was all with the caveat if you're doing this on your own. I think the best way to analyze your games is to do so with your opponent, if possible, or, or with a friend. Uh, you know, preferably a friend who's better at chess than you, but even just a friend of any kind. It's really helpful to be analyzing with somebody, to have ideas to, to bounce off, and they can sort of counter your ideas as well. OK. Let us continue along then. So this was sort of the, the two examples I really wanted to show on this idea of weak squares in the opening. In particular, we looked at two examples where the light squared bishop was developed out a little bit early and then blocked out of the game uh, in the first game by f5 and the second game by e6. And then white was able to score a quick win uh, because of these weak squares. And the main point, again, that I'm trying to get across is that you have to be thinking uh, about these moves. right? You can't just be blindly relying on chess principles, because that's how you get the game that, that I just looked at there. Uh, so now I want to jump to a different type of game entirely. And this is one from the mid-1800s by the legendary Paul Morphy. We're going to look at it from his perspective, actually, uh, against Napoleon. And not Napoleon Bonaparte, but uh, a different Napoleon who I believe uh, like participated in, in a bunch of American chess things. Maybe, I, I don't actually know where he was from, but he was a big chess player back in the 1800s. Uh, definitely one of, the, one of the world's best at that time. Uh, although nobody was really competing with Paul Morphy at the time. So let's take a look at this game and talk about what happened with White's play. So we have e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6. So far, so normal. Bishop c4 and black replied bishop c5, uh, arriving at the Gioco Piano, the old quiet game. And uh, someone in the chat was actually asking about the Evans Gambit before we started, and that's actually what we see played here. Uh, white continues out with the move b4 with the hope of distracting this bishop from controlling the center. So we get bishop takes b4. Now c3 uh, continues to increase white's central control. Black retreats this bishop back to a5, White continues now with d4, and black captures on d4. And this is sort of in line with the thinking of the day. All these like late 1800 games, even I think sometimes, probably not early 1900s, I think they had things a little bit more figured out then. But basically, the, the way they played chess uh, was, was very romantic, uh, as you may know. Uh, it's called the romant Romantic Era for a reason. They believed it was white's duty to sacrifice material and try to play for checkmate. And it was black's duty to capture that extra material and then hold on for dear life. And if you don't get checkmated, then you get to win because you have all the extra pieces. Uh, and so that's why you see a lot of these gambits from players with the white pieces. And that's why you see players with the black pieces sometimes naively sort of fully accepting things like the Danish gambit, just saying, yeah, I'm taking all your pawns. If you can checkmate me, then you win. But if you can't checkmate me, then I win. That's just how they thought chess should be played, right? White has the first move, white should go crazy. Black has to go second, so black should just take the material and, and hope for the best. And that's kind of what we see to some extent going on here. Now, the difference with Paul Morphy is that somehow he always seemed to take the material when it was good and always seemed to defend well when, when he had to, right? This guy was sort of way ahead of his time. 
Uh, okay, so there's two main moves here for white. Number one is castling, which makes a lot of sense, right? White wants to control the center with the C pawn. Right now it's pinned, so castling removes the pin. And number two is this move, queen b3, which makes sense because it's attacking these light squares. So let's talk about both of these moves from our perspective of thinking about it as a chess game, not just as an opening, but as a chess game from move one. Uh, how can we arrive at these two main moves? Well, we have to look at what the point of this gambit is. You have to understand why white is playing the move b4. White plays the move b4 to gain time on the bishop and to loosen its control of the center. So with c3, we succeed in gaining time on the bishop and controlling the center. d4, the natural follow-up, makes sense. We want to control the center. e takes d4. And now we have to make a decision with white, right? With move one, with e5 on move one, black has weakened the light squares by denying himself the opportunity to play e6, shutting this diagonal down at a later date. That's what I'm saying, man. Move one, that's when it starts. So that's why the move queen b3 is perfectly reasonable. It fits in line with our gambit play. We gain time on the bishop for rapid development and control of the center. And so with this extra tempo we got with c3, we can now consider playing the move queen b3 and attacking this pawn on f7 directly, and then continuing with our development thereafter. For example, the main line goes with queen e7, and once again, kingside castles, with the idea, once again, of capturing back on d4, controlling the center, rapid development. This is the goal of the gambit. But white perhaps lost sight of this in the game. Uh, the other move, by the way, is the immediate castles, which I think is a little bit more obvious than queen b3. And once again, the idea is mainly to simply recapture on d4 and build your big center in exchange for your pawn. Right? This was the goal of the Evans gambit all along. Instead, though, white plays the move e5. And this doesn't really make sense in line with, uh, uh, with our gambit here. It just doesn't make that much sense. So why is that? You know, e5 seems like a perfectly reasonable move. It takes away space from, uh, from your opponent. Uh, and it sort of goes to, to develop some kind of attack, perhaps. But you have to understand that gambits are not about checkmating the king as fast as possible. That's what they didn't understand back in the 1800s. And that's what a lot of players at you know, sort of the beginner level don't understand still today. It's not about checkmate. It's not about immediately checkmating your opponent. If that's the reason why you're playing a gambit, then you're probably not playing that gambit correctly. Uh, and so this is my advice to anybody who's thinking about trying those, tr those crazy gambits that you see online. It's, it's fine to try them. Some of them are quite fun. Some of them are good. Some of them do end in checkmate rather quickly. But that's not the goal of a gambit. The goal of a gambit is to develop your pieces quickly. It's to control the center. It's to hamper your opponent's development. And if you're not doing those things, then more often than not, the gambit is not going to work out in your favor. So e5, perhaps the first kind of mistake by white, not advancing the lead in development, not attacking the squares that have been weakened by the opponent, instead just playing sort of a, a reasonable looking move. OK, so how should Morphe respond, chat? How should we respond to e5? We are the side that has captured the extra, extra material. We are now honor bound to defend it and uh, try not to get checkmated so we can win the game later on. What should we do? How to continue with black here? And yeah, uh, someone in the chat does have the answer here. Uh, we should play the move d5. And this might not be the most obvious to, uh, to some of you. I'm actually surprised this is the first move that got suggested. Should su suggested? Tough to talk sometimes. I would have thought many, many people were thinking about the move knight g to e7. Right? This seems like the most natural to me. And it's a fine move. Black is still better, because white has done a lot of stuff wrong so far, namely playing the Evans Gambit. But uh, it's not the best that black can do, and it's sort of important to understand why. Uh, so what's black's biggest problem here? It's that this diagonal has been weakened by the move e7, e5. The light squares 
have been weakened. White is considering threats like knight g5, considering threats like queen b3, and an attack on the f7 pawn. So, with e5, thankfully, white has given up some control of these light squares. The really, really important light squares that white needs to control has given up, uh, Napoleon has actually given up some of that control by playing e5, no longer directly defending the d5 square. So, what Paul Morphy's goal uh, should be is to sort of negate this pressure on this diagonal and find some way to, to finish development. Uh, so, knight g7 is an efficient way of doing that, but perhaps d5 is a bit better because it gets the critical light squared bishop into the game. Now, what's different between this position and the last position, where developing the bishop was actually the mistake that weakened the squares? Well, in this case, our weakness is not really on the queen side. Our weakness is on the king side, thanks to our opening with uh, e7, e5, and white's bishop now planted on c4. So we need this bishop out, out on a square like e6, out on a square like f5, where it can contribute to the game, maybe drop back to g6, and defend our light squared weaknesses. So that's why d5 is the best move here. It may not look like the most natural move, which might be knight g to e7, but it is the best move because it helps to defend our weak light squares. Uh, notably, this is not a move that would really be possible if white had left this pawn on the, uh, on the e4 square, right? It's just defended too many times here. So e5, allowing d5, allowing black to enter the game with the light squared bishop, and this is sort of the level of understanding that Paul Morphy had where his opponents did not. This thinking about chess from the first move and understanding what the actual point of the Evans Gambit is and what the problems are for black to solve. So e takes d6, queen takes d6, played in the game. Now white does go ahead and castle, but black is ready with knight g e7, blocking the e file and ready to castle uh, himself. White chose knight g5 and Morphy just castles. This pawn is defended twice and there's no real major issues here for, uh, for black. Black is, is sort of just winning with the extra material. Uh, it's sort of too late now for white to try the move queen to b3. Uh, it can simply be met with queen to g6, when again, Morphy is ready to defend against this onslaught on the f7 pawn. So white tried to switch tactics here and went after the uh, h7 pawn on a different diagonal. But once again, thanks to Morphy's strong opening play, uh, he was ready with bishop f5 and just uh, a winning position, just an outright winning position. Now, because Morphy is Morphy, uh, bishop f5 isn't as simple as it may seem because white does actually have a bit of a tactic here to seemingly regain some material, but uh, you know it's, it's just going to be winning for black in the end. But before we jump into that, uh, I want to pause here because... This is the moment when you can really truly say that black has won the opening battle and it's clear to understand why, right? White didn't understand this concept of attacking on the light squares, didn't really understand this concept of taking over the center, and those are two really critical concepts in the Evans Gambit. So, what's the point? The point is you have to understand what the goal of your gambit is. Very, very few gambits, the goal is to just directly checkmate the opponent. And so if you're not you know, going for these goals, if you're just trying to make checkmating threats like knight g5, like bishop d3, you're just not going to get a good position. It's just not how chess works, unfortunately. Uh, okay, so questions here. Hello, yes, hello everyone, just joining. Is this instinct instinctual? So some of it comes from prior knowledge, right? Some of it comes from understanding, you know, uh, the, the goal in the Evans Gambit. And, and that comes from, you know, look, looking at players better than myself and sort of just analyzing the, the actual move. So like, what does b4 in the Evans Gambit do? Well, it moves the bishop away from control of the center. So the goal should be to control the center, right? Uh, what about queen h5 instead of bishop d3? Also, bishop a3 has been mentioned, and, and yes. Yeah. So bishop a3 is why this is more complicated than it may seem at first, and that's what happens in the game. But before we jump into that, let's talk about queen h5 instead. So queen h5 is a good idea, trying to attack all these squares. 
But again, black is ready with, with queen g6 in this case, just defending, uh, just, just defending the light squares, right? This was Morphe's idea, d5, activating the bishop, and also activating the queen. I guess I, I didn't explicitly mention that, but activating the queen to help defend the light squares as well is, is also critical. It's a good question. And then, yeah, as someone in the chat has pointed out, uh, white seemingly has a tactic here with bishop a3. Uh, in the game, white actually chose to capture on f5 first, which doesn't really change anything, and then follows this up with bishop a3 when seemingly black is losing the exchange. And it's true, black is losing the exchange, but the, the good news is it, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is black's opening problem of an attack on the light squares has completely disappeared. There is no more attack on the light squares. And by the way, black is currently up two pawns. So two pawns for the exchange is even material. And on top of that, it's actually now black who has the better development in the more active pieces. So bl black is still just winning. Uh, we see queen g6 in the game. Bishop takes f8, capturing the rook. Really, what else can you do? And then Morphe makes a, a very excellent observation. And that observation is this knight is defending the king and this bishop has sort of nowhere to go back on this diagonal. So we see Morphe actually capture the knight rather than the bishop here. Now white has to spend a tempo to save the bishop, coming all the way back to a3. And now after d takes c3, uh, black just has three pawns for the exchange. The c3 pawn is very powerful. There's no way to develop this knight, and clearly black is, is just winning. Uh, bishop c1 played in the game, coming back to the starting square. Uh, just queen back to g6 is great for Morphe. Now bishop f4, developing out the other way this time. Uh, simply rook d8, bringing the final piece into the game. We see uh, queen c2, now knight d4, now queen e4. And if you guys at home want to try to find the final tactic here, go ahead and pause the video uh, or let me know in the chat. Uh, I'll open this one up to the chat because it's, it's a fun end to a game. So black to move and win. Black to move and win here. Also, Crypto has a couple good general questions that I will get to after we wrap up this game. Knight f3 check doesn't quite work, right? There's queen takes f3. Okay, rook e8 doesn't quite work because there's queen takes e8. c2, okay, c2 is fine, but it's not the beautiful finish. C2 is fine. Yeah, C2 is a fine move, but it's not the beautiful finish, everybody. We're talking about Morphe here. This game has lasted 170 years. You think it lasted 170 years because Morphe played C2? So some people in the chat do have it now. Uh, Knight G3 is, is the finish to this game. Uh, taking advantage of the fact that this queen is attacked, so there's no time to capture the knight. And if queen takes g6, as played in the game, black's idea is, of course, checkmate. King has nowhere to go. So that's the beautiful finish to the game. And sort of, you know, really shows how quickly things can turn around if you're playing, you know, seemingly fine moves, right? Seemingly, you know, attack, attacking moves like e5, but not understanding the point of the opening. In this case, the weak light squares. Uh, okay. So we have some time left. I want to move on to another game eventually. Oh, but first Crypto had a couple questions. So Crypto was asking, you know, how many moves is the, uh, how many moves is an opening? So it, it's not really number of moves. It's more about what position you're getting on the board. So some people, it, I mean, it, there's no set definition is the answer as to what an opening is. Generally, when the main goals of the opening have been achieved, when both sides' pieces are fully developed, when the kings are castled or the kings are reasonably safe, and when there's sort of some situation in the center that, uh, you know, the, the situation becomes a bit clearer in the center. That's normally when you say the, the opening's finished. But of course, there are games where one side never gets fully developed and they last like 40 moves. So was that whole game an opening? I don't know. It, it's tough to classify these things. Uh, and lastly, he asked, should you try to trade queens always as black? And that is sort of the line of thinking that they had in the 1850s, where every chess game was black takes extra material, white plays for checkmate. 
But not every game goes like that. So the answer is, as always, it, it depends. Some games, if you're under attack, really good to trade queens. Other games, sometimes black's queen just turns out to be the more valuable piece. And that's too general of a question for me to, to give you sort of more guiding principles than that. Uh, OK, now I wanted to turn back to one of my own games. This is a game that I played against someone named Derek Higgins back in February of this year, back when chess tournaments were still a real thing. And I wanted to show you sort of a, a lesser example of uh, the wrong idea in a gambit once again. So let's take a look. Uh, I played d4, and we're going to look from my perspective. We see knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, and you guys know I couldn't stay away. Had to mention the f3 nimzo in a 10th lecture in a row, and, and that's, what we have, uh, that's what we have here as well. Uh, Derek continued with d5. I play a3 here. Uh, once again, the point of my opening is to control the light squares. This bishop is interfering with my knight controlling e4, so I want to kick it away. Black chooses to capture instead, but seemingly, while this loosens my grip on the light squares, it actually advances my plan a little bit by helping to support my d4 pawn, which is going to need support if I play e4, and black opens up the center. So sort of a, a complicated way to, to play for the idea of the opening, but it, it is sort of consistent uh, regardless. Now black continues with c5. I want to fix my doubled pawns, so I capture on d5. And now black plays a move, which is perfectly fine. It, it's a good move, but is sort of uh, counterintuitive, right? So, so far in this game, what has been going on? I've played f3, declaring my intention to play e4, fighting for the light squares. So black plays d5, not allowing me to gain control of these light squares, sort of fighting back for those squares. Then we see a3, and black again removes the defender of the light squares. Seemingly, black is fighting very hard to keep me from playing e4. I take back, we get c5, takes. So now, you would expect black to take back with the pawn, right? Uh, staying consistent, still fighting for these light squares. Instead, black plays the move knight takes d5. And this is one of those moves that is sort of the exception to the rule. But it's also a move you have to be very, very careful with. Uh, and, and those things go hand in hand. So if you play an opening line, or if you find yourself in a position where you're playing a move that doesn't seem really to be that consistent with your previous play, you, you have to be very, very careful. So knight takes d5, if you know your stuff, isn't even really a, a risky line. But if you don't know your stuff, black could very easily fall into a, a very worse position, and that's what actually happens in this game. So what's wrong with knight takes d5? Well, it allows white to play e4, sort of at any moment. And in exchange for this, black plays for this very loose concept of you know, having an advantage in development, having an advantage in activity, and immediately taking the fight to, uh, to the player with the white pieces by using this development to attack some of these dark squares, like c3. So the point I'm trying to make is that if black doesn't follow up with this attack on the dark squares and starts to sort of drift away and not follow the point of the opening, that's when you're immediately going to get into trouble. Uh, also, that's a free pawn. So I capture on c5, and that's how I'm fitting this in to be sort of a, a gambit. So let's take a look at how this one goes wrong for black. First of all, knight takes c3 is a legal chess move, so I guess I should talk about it. It's just not a very good chess move because I'm able to take on d8 and play bishop b2 and immediately win a pawn. So that's why black isn't immediately capturing here. Instead, we see the move queen a5, which is the main move and a better move. Then I follow up with the move e4, which is, again, the point of my opening, trying to stay consistent. And black does not actually continue with knight takes c3. So sort of a counterintuitive opening here. Black is a fighting for the dark squares and then sort of giving up on them. So why not knight takes c3? Well, the move queen d2 is pretty good. And again, you're going to get something similar. We're after bishop b2, knight a4. Again, I'm able to win a pawn back on g7. So some tactical ideas here to be aware of. Uh, black plays the move knight e7. 
And now white plays bishop b3 to defend this pawn on c5. And for the third and final time, again, black should not be capturing on c3, even though it looks tempting. White will play the move king f2, which is pretty much as good as castling in this case. Uh, we get the king out of the center behind sort of a pawn shield, and it's out of the way for a rook to invade in the game. And this has actually been done before, but white just gets a pretty comfortable position after some pretty natural development here. The queen has to go away. And, you know, white is able to uh, develop out quite naturally, has some extra space, and gain some time on the queen. Okay, but all of, none of that's really important. What's important is the move knight d7 here. So this is the beginning of the mistakes by Derek Higgins. So let me get you in Black's mindset here. Here's what I think Black was thinking. Black was thinking, I sacrificed a pawn. I should take that back. And that's just the wrong way to approach this position. It's, it's just really the wrong way to, to approach it. Black didn't understand the point of the opening. And so the, the second he wasn't sure of what the theory was, he ends up just trying to regain the pawn. Uh, and when you don't follow the point of your opening, that, that's when things can get pretty nasty pretty quickly here. So what should Black have done instead? Well, Black should have just castled. Just castled the king. Right? Black's idea is that there is a lead in development and weaknesses uh, on white's queen side. So what black should expand this development and continue out further. And the theory goes for quite a ways here and is seemingly weird. Uh, black actually retreats with queen c7 because queen b4 is often a good move for, um, for white. Now bishop b5 is one of the main ideas. I think I recommended a4 in my lecture series. And now black can play the move knight d7, regaining this pawn and fighting for the dark squares on the queen side. So what's different about this position than last position? Well, really the, the only difference is that black has gotten castled. Uh, so black's mistake was not understanding that this opening is about this lead in development and using it to get the king safe, using it to activate your pieces on the queen side. And you can't really skip around and skip steps like this with knight to d7. Again, knight takes d5 is a risky move, giving white control over the e4 square, which white you know, has already said they wanted with the move f3. And if you deviate in a risky opening like that, then you end up in trouble. OK, all of that is to say queen b3. Now, black should really castle. If black castles here, black is probably still doing OK. But instead, black continued out with knight c6, right? And at this point, it, it's already uh, a little bit too late for black to, to equalize in this game. I continued out with a4. The point now being, I want to go queen a3 and uh, attack along this weakened diagonal. Once again, black trades off the bishop, the dark squared bishop, weakening the dark squares. And then we see black nonchalantly not castling. And now the price will be paid for these dark squared weaknesses. Knight takes c5 is played in the game, but now queen a3, and these squares are already tough to stop. Uh, black probably should have played b6, but I think that uh, he may have been concerned about bishop b5, when all of a sudden there's bishop d2 ideas trapping the queen, there's also bishop takes c5 ideas, but uh, this was probably black's best move and best chance of, of staying in the game. Instead, uh, black chose to play knight back to d7, which is of course just quite bad. So now black has given up the dark squared bishop, thereby weakening the dark squares. Black then spent a lot of time before castling to capture the c5 pawn, opening up the dark square diagonal. And because of those reasons, black is now just, just lost out of the opening, as we've seen before. Uh, so how to continue? Well, you don't really have to do anything crazy here with white. I just continue developing the pieces with knight e2. Black plays queen d8, sort of desperately trying to block off this diagonal. I just continue now with knight d4, trading off defenders of the dark squares and ready to activate my bishop. We see now a6, which is trying to stop knight b5 jumping in to d6 ideas. Uh, and now I simply just trade off this defender, as, as I said, and plant the queen on d6. And, and yeah, this is just clearly now an opening disaster. And black is quickly uh, losing in this game. 
Uh, Derek actually found some pretty inventive moves to try to get back into the game, which I'll show. Knight b8 was played, which is rather funny that the knight ends up back on b8, and black has officially undeveloped all the pieces. Sort of a similarity of the Morphe game there. But now queen g3 uh, still is giving black some trouble. Uh, kingside castles by black. Now I wanted to play something involving bishop h6, but it doesn't quite work immediately because queen f6 is there. So I did a weird little stutter step. Uh, well, sorry, first bishop c4 just developing, then after queen e7. Now I want to play bishop h6, but queen f6 works. So I do this weird little stutter step with bishop to f4, uh, threatening bishop d6, and bishop takes b8. This induces my opponent to play queen c5, and now that there's no queen f6, bishop h6 is just winning material. And then continued with g6, take on f8, take on f8, and queen c7, not bothering to defend the bishop, just counterattacking against this undeveloped queen side. And we don't have to spend too much time looking at the rest of the game, because it's pretty far from an opening. But at the end of the day, uh, in a very tactical game, black does end up just sort of getting checkmated here. Here, I think white's just up a full rook. And then last move of the game, uh, well, sorry, yeah, I think this is the last move of the game. White to move and win everybody. See if you can find the finishing tactic. And then we'll, we'll review this, this opening a little bit. Talk a little bit more about what happened here. And yeah, Chess King has the answer. Always the tactician. Rook takes h5 is the game ender. Uh, and here my opponent actually resigned. If you take this guy, then you get checked and checked and checked, uh, this time with no escape. And I really wanted to show this game in one of my lectures because what's better than checkmating with the boat, right? We got the boat pawn structure and, and we, we constructed a boat and delivered checkmate on the same move. Like what's, what's not to love about this checkmate? I was very mad at my opponent for not allowing me to play it and, and resigning. Uh, I could have had the boat immortal. It would have been great, but it wasn't meant to be. Black resigned after rook h5. Uh, also, very quickly, just to mention, if pawn takes h5, then this check. And again, g3 is enough. In this case, all these moves are, are checkmate. Oh, and sorry, one more, one more, one more. If king h4, then queen g3, or queen takes f6. But OK, so let's talk about this opening once again. What happened here? What happened here? Well, uh, I took on d5, and black captures back with the knight not understanding that this opening requires some urgency by black. And then by delaying castling, black ends up uh, just in a much worse position due to the weakness of the dark squares, due to black not understanding the danger of giving up this dark squared bishop early on. And that is the story of the game. Queen e th okay, we're, we're talking about some checkmates now. Don't worry about it. I'm sure there's a thousand mates there. You guys might have a faster one. But you can't tell me that you have a better mate than the boat. Okay, there's no better checkmates than the boat. Uh, all right, with this, I want to move on to, I guess, one more example. We only have a few minutes left. But uh, I'm going to pop over now to a game between Magnus Carlsen and someone by the name of Atle Groen. Some Norwegian name. This was from a Norwegian championship, and it's way back in 2005, back when Magnus was not the world champion, although I, I think he was a grandmaster by, by the time of this game. And so I showed you enough of gambits going wrong, first with Napoleon just completely misplaying the Evans gambit, and then in that next game, which is kind of a sort of a gambit. You, you wouldn't call it a, a gambit directly. But black didn't understand the point, just played to regain the pawn instead of castle the king and develop the pieces, and that's why things went wrong. So let's take a look at an example of a gambit going well. Just wanted to show one fun game here that I came across. So in this game, Magnus goes knight f3, and we're going to sort of blow past all this stuff because we are short on time, and I want to get to the full game here. So. Black has played queen b6 and now continues out with knight to e4. So what does this tell you? Well, this tells you that black is very, very interested in attacking the dark squares on the queen side, right? These are all moves bringing pieces to the queen side, trying to target these dark squares. 
And in this case, it, it's just not the greatest idea for black because of the specifics of it, because white has the first move. You know, things like this are a little bit less likely to work from the black side. But at its core, it makes some sense, right? We see white developing this bishop out, black attacking the bishop, and the bishop sort of becoming sort of forlorn over here on the h4 square. Sort of some, some hints of that first game I showed against him, where the bishop was out of play, so black is trying to attack on this diagonal. It, it makes some sense. Magnus, though, just continues with e3, and we see bishop to b4. Now bishop to d3, and now queen to a5. So, what's going on here? Black has launched an attack on these dark squares. How should Magnus deal with this threat? What do you guys think? What do you think in the chat room? What should white do here to deal with this threat to the knight on c3? And yeah, Thomas and Jurgen and the Smasher all have the right idea here. So, at its core, this looks rather similar to those first couple games that we looked at, where one side's bishop gets developed out a little early, blocked outside the pawn chain, and as a result, these squares on the queen side become weak. The dark squares, in this case, with this bishop out on h4. Now, in the previous games, we were looking at it with colors reversed, where it was a bishop uh, stuck out on f5 or g4, but the same principle should sort of hold in theory here. But the key difference to understand is that black has wasted a lot of time in pursuit of this dark squared attack, spending two moves getting this knight into the game, spending two moves getting this queen into the game, and spending a couple moves to, to defend the center first as well. Whereas Magnus has been very, very efficient with, uh, with his moves, right? Uh, I didn't say h6 was a waste of time, by the way, because it forced a waste of time by white as well. So that's why I excluded those moves. But aside from those moves, let's look at what Magnus has played. He has played d4 and c4, and every move aside from that has developed a piece. Every move. Every move aside from this h6 bishop h4, where neither side really lost time, right? Black spent time on h6, white spent time on bishop h4. So because of those reasons, white is perfectly justified in sacrificing a pawn here. Because white has this lead in development, white is able and ready to sacrifice the pawn on c3 without any real concerns. So that's why castles is perfectly, perfectly fine here. No need to sweat this pawn on c3. No need to do anything crazy like take on e4, giving up a great bishop just because we're worried about the knight on c3. Just castles is great. Uh, black does go ahead and capture on c3. We see takes back. Takes back, the rook's attacked, so now rook a to b1, making use of the newly opened b file, right? Uh, black now continues by taking on c4. We see it captures back. Bishop back to b4 for uh, Atle. And now I want to ask you guys, we've seen gambits going wrong here. Uh, we've seen them going wrong. So let's see if you can identify where white's strengths are and where black's weaknesses are in this opening. And this is why I sort of talked from such a general perspective earlier in the lecture. Because sometimes your opponents just do crazy stuff, like Atla here. Like this wasn't an opening Magnus had prepped. I guarantee you this is not something Magnus had prepped. He just sort of finds himself in this position where he sacrificed his, his B pawn and he has this lead in development. So it's really useful to train this skill of trying to identify where the weaknesses are, where your advantages are, where you can attack. So, chat room, in general, you don't have to give me a specific move, but what are the weaknesses for black? What are the strengths for white in this position? Such a waste of time to ask the audience. Well, if I don't ask you guys, then you might fall asleep. And I would not like that. So there are a lot of different ideas going around. So the, the idea I'm seeing the most is talking about this bishop on c8 and also talking about the queen's side. Uh, particularly, uh, I imagine these two open files. And, and that is the thing I would hope you guys would notice. I also hoped you would potentially notice 
the inclusion of h7 to h6. So this bishop combined with h7 to h6 combined with white's pressure on the light squares means that the light squares are what white should be looking to attack. It's sort of the reverse of what we saw in games one and two. In those games, a bishop was trapped outside the pawn chain. In this case, the bishop is trapped inside the pawn chain, unable to combat the threats on this diagonal for one, and number two, threats to squares like f7. So Magnus correctly identifies that the light squares are where the attack should be headed, and those other things mentioned in the chat, by the way, are all great ideas. The king is stuck in the center. Uh, right, we have good activity on, on the queen side as well. But the key thing I wanted you guys to notice was this weakness on the light squares. And, and that's where Magnus ends up winning this game, beginning with the move knight e5, attacking the weakened light squares, right? h7, h6, by the way. I, I mentioned this because it weakens this g6 square even further. Black continues now with bishop to d6, trying perhaps to, you know, just capture this knight and gain back some of the light squares. And here, Magnus Carlsen already, I think, has the opportunity to immediately win the game with some stellar sacrifices, but first starts with f4, which is just as good. Black plays queen back to c7, desperately trying to find some way to defend these light squares on the, on the king side that this bishop cannot access. Uh, Magnus continued with queen e4, which is sort of not the best move in this case, but black doesn't find the way to punish. Black tries to play b6, trying to develop the bishop this way, I guess, or out to a6, but it's, it's just too little too late. Uh, white to move with a winning advantage here. Really, there's numerous things you can do, but Magnus finds the best with knight takes f7, just ripping open these light squares even further, understanding the point of the position is that white black lacks control of the light squares and just breaking through with that idea in mind. Queen takes f7, and now f5, just immediately ripping open the light squares further. And bishop takes e6 after queen h5. Knight d7 was played, and just f6 now, opening up the f file for the rooks. And this game does not last much longer. Rook takes f6, black sacrifices the queen. Magnus doesn't even take it. And we see check, check, and mate. Uh, and, and Magnus wins this game in glorious fashion. Uh, I don't actually know if he won the Norwegian Championship in 2005, but I imagine with games like this, he, he was probably, probably up there with the leaders. So that is going to conclude our lecture here tonight. Uh, hopefully, the main points you, you guys got away from this is that you can't just solely rely on principles in the opening. It's really, really important to start thinking of it as a chess game from move one. Aside from that, hopefully you got a little bit better at identifying these weak squares and using them to guide your thinking. Not as a replacement for your thinking, but to guide your thinking. Uh, if you're watching live, please head on over to the Twitch channel now. We're going to do a special segment of Tactics Time. Uh, and if you've had enough chess for the night or if you're watching the YouTube version, I want to thank you very much for watching. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.